All right, Francis. So born and raised in San Francisco? No, no. Oh. I, I've lived in San Francisco for a long, we've lived here for over 20 years, but I was born, I was raised in the South. I, I lived in oh. uh, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi for a year and Arkansas. Wow. And I didn't come to San Francisco. My husband and I got married in Savannah, Georgia in okay. 1928. And the next day we got in our car. We just wanted to live in San Francisco. And the big plan was to be here for two years. And then, cause our, we don't have any family in California. Um, oh, wow. So yeah, we were going to just stay here for two years and then head back like probably to the East. My husband's from Massachusetts. So we were mm -hmm. probably head somewhere East and we just never left. We're still here. <laughs> so <laughs> 20 years later. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> you obviously like it in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was, I lived up there for uh, about four years. Okay. So. Where are yeah. you? I'm in San Diego. I'm yeah. originally from San Diego and yeah. And then uh, I got a job. I've, I've done, I did radio, I've done radio for 15 years. Um, yeah. So I, I was on the radio here in San Diego and then I got a job in San Francisco. So I worked up there for a while and then I got shipped back down here to San Diego. <laughs> so okay, well, San Diego is great. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's hard to complain. Yeah. <laughs> so it's totally. been good, but blue skies, 70 degrees. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know I was outside earlier and I was like hot in my sweatshirt. Like I took yeah. our, I have a, we have a four-year-old and we went down to the park because he was just being obnoxious during wow. my wife's trying to have meetings. And like, I was interviewing somebody earlier and he's running by. So I'm like, we got to get him to the park. So I took him down there for a while. And I was like hot outside in a sweatshirt, right. which January. is bizarre. Yeah, I know, <laughs> right. right? It's so crazy. Yeah. So you were born and raised in the South. Um, yeah. How did you get into music? You know, it's really funny because I, uh, you know, I've listened to some of your podcasts and it's like my story is pretty different from a lot of the people that you interview. Um, I got into music really late. Um, I'd always loved music. Um, I, I played violin when I was, you know, little. I played for like eight or nine years and played guitar when I was in high school and stuff, but um, just for myself. And mm -hmm. for me, like I always loved music, but the thought of actually performing or trying to, you know, join a band or something was just overwhelming because I couldn't imagine performing. I had so much oh. performance that like the thought of actually getting up in front of people was just like a no-go for me. Uh -huh. So um, it's, it's something that I never even entertained. Um, and uh, it's interesting because when I lived, I lived in Atlanta for a while and we, we used to, um, my best friend and I used to, there's a little place called Eddie's Attic there where they'd have open mic nights. And uh, we went so often that the guy who owns Eddie would ask us to judge the open mic nights. Um, <laughs> we, were the, we were like the, the only people that would be there from six until midnight. And so, you know, we, we were there yeah. for the whole thing. And, uh, and so he would give us a free dinner and free drinks if we judged and we had no oh. business judging, but, um, that's how much I love, you know, we loved going to these things, but I was always like, God, I could never do that. Even though I was kind of quietly writing my own songs. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah so I never, you were writing, that was going to be my question. You were always just writing, but in your room, you were never showing writing, anybody. Not sharing it with anybody okay. now. Um, and, uh, yeah, but then it was funny. So, you know, I ended up, my husband and I got married, we ended up moving to San Francisco, um, and then it, it honestly, you know, I had uh, my first son, Liam, and um, it, he was like a super colicky baby. Like it was a very tough first year. I was like, mm -hmm. I was a zombie, like the first year. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that calmed him down and calmed me down was music, was me playing guitar. And oh. so um, that's when I sort of got my guitar. I'd been grant writing and, you know, doing nothing related to music at all. But I sort of, when he was born, um, I, got, I got my guitar back out and started just playing a lot more. Um, and then he started this cooperative preschool and, uh, and part of the deal with going to a co-op preschool is that, you know, you work one day a week and then you also contribute, you know, you fundraise. And so, uh, I started writing songs. We had this, Liam and I had this little great little routine where, you know, we go to the preschool or we go to the park, whatever. And at night he would take these long bubble baths. And I would sit on the edge of the tub and I would just write songs about what he'd done that day and what his friends had done. And just like, that's how all this, you know, that's how I started writing a lot of songs like every day, uh -huh. um, just with him in the bath, you know, while he was in the bathtub. And, uh, and so I ended up taking those songs and, um, and I said, well, I, I maybe I'll just use this as my fundraiser for the preschool. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what I did. That's, that's, that's kind of how I, you know, so you yeah. recorded the songs that you were making up as the year was going by and and you what so you, you put it together as a record and sold it to make money yeah, for the well school? no it didn't happen that it happened a lot more organically i had no idea how to record anything so i i went luckily my my husband his cousin had just moved to san francisco and he had been songwriting 
and he was demoing just on his computer. So I went to his house and we just did a little home recording like at his house wow. with vacuum cleaners going, you could hear like the neighbors, the <laughs> lo-fi, like so lo-fi. Um, Which is so thing. in right now, the lo-fi. <laughs> yeah, it's really funny. We didn't know what we were doing at all. And so, and I would take these like weekly trips to Home Depot. I would buy jewel cases and I would, I made my own little album cover and I had a paper cutter and I just would, I'd burn my own CDs on my computer and make the jewel cases. And I would, and my only intention was to sell them at the preschool. Like I never, ever thought it would go beyond this little sure. tiny community, you know? And I was really happy just doing that. And um, yeah, but it's, it was really interesting because I started selling them at the preschool and then people started buying more to send, you know, to the East coast and to mm -hmm. family and friends and all that stuff. And, um, you know, within like probably six months, I realized that I had burned like more than a thousand CDs at home on my own computer, you know, just wow. me. Just yeah. Me. I was like, there's there's a better way to do this. Probably. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I mean, wow. yeah. At that, I was going to library school at the time too. Um, in the evenings, I I kind of thought that I was going to become a children's librarian. It's kind of I love libraries, and I thought that's kind of where I was going. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no intention at all you know that's so so that that's the first record fascinating creatures that was that one that was that one yeah wow so the the original stuff so even later when you just kept pressing them they were still just the same recordings with the 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 vacuum and the neighbors and all that yeah in fact i never even mastered that one i didn't even know what mastering was at that point you know? <laughs> oh wow <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, yeah it was just so yeah raw super so raw. after the fact that you when you so you start seeing that people are interested in this. Do you, when do you decide, oh, hey, this could be like a career. Let's start writing another It took record. a really, yeah, it took a long time for me to think of it as a career. I just thought, wow, this is kind of like a fun U-turn, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I didn't even know that there was like a, because I was the first one in my group of friends to have kids. I didn't even know there was like a kid's world kids music world you sure. know been aware and 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 then so i started looking into it and i found you know there's this incredible community of people who make independent kids music and, and i've become really good friends with lots of them but um i didn't know about that at that point and um you know i had this huge hang up with performing and so um the funny thing is i so this started taking off and um and you know people started asking me to come play just little shows like at the preschool or at, you know, birthday parties and parents would ask me and I would say, you know, that is so nice of you to ask, but no thanks. Like, I don't, I don't, do, that, you know? I don't do live shows. <laughs> so funny. And, uh, but then like, you know, when they actually, when the kids started asking me, when I started getting like three and four year olds, like coming into the schoolyard, like singing my songs, knowing all the lyrics and saying, can you bring your guitar and sing the song? I was like, oh my God, you know, of course I have to say, yeah, yeah. I can't, to. Say no. yeah. <laughs> you can't yeah. tell a kid a no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had to figure out a way to like overcome this like kind of intense fear that I had of like, I've, I've always been a behind the scenes person. I'm, you know, it's just, I, um, I had to figure out a way to make it work for me to, you know, be okay getting mm -hmm. in front of people and singing. So what? I just started really small. Yeah. Yeah. How did you like, what did you do to get over that stage fright? Did you just have to go out and say, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do this. Or did you kind of prepare yourself? I definitely, pra I, I mean, I practiced um, a lot. Sure. <laughs> but, I, but I also, um, yeah, I started really small. Um, we had this great guy here in San Francisco named Enzo Garcia, who um, he played on Jolie Hall and some of her like first records, but um, okay. he used to have this family music hour on Saturdays. And um, Liam and I used to go and uh, to some of them. And I always kind of found him really funny because he was kind of a cranky kids performer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like He had great songs, a great musician, but he would be kind of grumpy, like with the parents sometimes. And I just, like, there's something like really endearing about him. Um, so he invited me to come play one song, you know? And um, so that's where I started. I just started, I just went and I played one song, you know, and, um, and it was fine, you know? <laughs> so I was like, got okay, through I it. <laughs> got through it. So I, yeah. And then I started showing up at the preschool and doing like circle time and um, you know, started, and, and I was terrified. I mean, it, it, these were all people I knew. These were all like two, three, four year olds, you know? Right. <laughs> and their parents. Um, I was going to say, and their parents. So you're about, yeah, if 
That would yeah. even be more intense, I think. If you screw up in front of all these people that you know, you're a little bit more self-conscious as if it was just a library full of kids that you had no idea it, who they were. It's true. It, it probably was, uh, yeah, worse because I knew them. But um, yeah, so I just started small. And um, I mean, how I, I mean, and it just took time. And I guess like for me, like I feel like everybody who suffers like who for with performance anxiety and stuff, they have to come up with ways, you know, for themselves. But for me, like personally, one of the best things I was able to do was just sort of reframe what was happening. Like um, I sort of took myself out of the equation. You know, I was like, this isn't, when I'm playing music in a group, this isn't really about me. It's about all of us like taking some time. We're together, you know, we're singing together. Like I'm just, I'm part of what's happening here. And when I took myself out of the equation, it was a lot easier for me to, you know, do it. So. Mm -hmm. And did you just keep going with it? Like after the, after the first performance and then, you know, playing at, at, at your child's school and when did you, were people asking you like, when are you going to put another record out? Like how, how did you continue with it? Yeah. Well, I mean, the songwriting was always my favorite part of it. So I was, I had tons of songs. I had oh, just okay. like, tons and tons of songs because I was writing songs every day all you know kids songs for for families um and uh so I definitely had like another you know an album's worth of um of songs uh and I did start getting asked like we started so we went I went from playing just like these really small solo things um in San Francisco but then within the year we were getting asked to play at like Austin city limits and wow. we got asked to play at Lollapalooza and um, oh come to South Carolina and do it like all these big things. And I didn't have a band. I'd never played in a band. Um, you know, I had no idea what I was doing. So um, I, I recruited my husband <laughs> to play bass with me. And then two other dads from the preschool um, just sort of jumped in who were musicians you know one uh -huh. my friend Jeff he was a bartender he had a very flexible schedule and uh sure and then my friend Tim played guitar and so we just you know would practice like every other week and yeah we started doing these shows um you know here in the bay area but then also kind of traveling a little bit with it as well so yeah getting getting to play those big festivals like when did those start coming to you was that right I mean, it was pretty early on. Early. I mean, I think it was after I released my second album. Um, yeah, it was, it was probably, I released Fascinating Creatures like in 2006. So, and then a couple of years later, I released one called Family Tree. And I think that's mm -hmm. when we started kind of traveling a little bit with it. That's when you started winning some awards, right? You won the Gold Parents Choice Award and a couple other awards for that record as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. It was great. I mean, it was interesting that time. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's changed. It, it's, it's really saturated right now. There's a lot of music back then, like there was no streaming services and like, mm -hmm. it was this little world. Um, and there were parenting magazines and blogs and it was, um, yeah, it, it, it honestly felt a little bit easier back then to sort of get attention. You know, <laughs> yeah. <us> now. So. <laughs> wow. Well, did you like, do you, you were talking about, you know, Lollapalooza and Austin city limits. Are you, did you do like a tour with the albums or, in, or anything like that? Not really. You know, it's so funny. I'm an introvert. I'm a homebody. I never really, I know a lot of people really enjoy traveling with for their music and it's honestly not something that I ever loved. Um, I mean, I loved, I, I enjoyed the experience but it kind of stressed me out to be honest. Um, so like all the logistics and all, yeah. doing all the, I did everything. Like I did everything from top to bottom. Um, oh, yeah. You're for, your own booking yeah. agent and manager and everything, huh? everything, all of it, you know? And, um, yeah, so it was, it was fun. I'm glad we did it, but at the same time, um, yeah, it, it was, you know, it, it wasn't my favorite part of it. My favorite part has always been like the, the writing. And then, you know, as I got better at it, the recording, I became to like, I love recording. That's kind of my favorite part of the experience at this point. But um, yeah. But 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 I'm glad. I'm glad we we did. We we uh -huh. we we didn't tour, but we we played enough. You know, a few times a year we'd go. Yeah, to different oh, places. That's cool. Yeah, because I've talked to a few other art children's artists that talk about touring, and and some of them had been in bands prior, and they're like, yeah. it's so much. It's so much better instead of playing at, you know, ten thirty on a Monday night. You're playing like a library at 11 a.m. <laughs> like, exactly. like, that's a pretty good gig to have. Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I can't imagine playing at 11 p.m. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's not. That would have never happened for me. <laughs> <laughs> 
so with okay so after you put out family tree that's when it's, things started kind of rolling i mean you're winning awards and stuff do you did you get signed to a record label like were pe like you know publicists and lawyers and people trying to contact you um, I never got, I never looked for a record label and I never, I've always done everything. I'm, I've definitely got a DIY mentality. Um, mm -hmm. Like I, I like kind of doing all of that. I've always done my own artwork, my own videos, my own, you know, it's like the university of YouTube where you just like learn everything that you need to know, Photoshop, Final Cut Pro. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of enjoy that. Um, so I've always done that for myself, all of that for myself. Um, but um, I did start getting sync deals. Like I got some really nice licensing deals mm -hmm. that were just, I mean, it's kind of the reason that we're in San Francisco. Like I, we wouldn't be living here if I hadn't gotten some of those sync deals because uh, with off, off of that very first album, like that home recording, um, there was a song called Blueberry Pancakes mm -hmm. and Bisquick, the pancake company, yeah. licensed that song. And um, wow. they found it. And, 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 and it's really funny because they, wanted it in a commercial and it was a big global it was back in the day when you know it was just like it was a huge amount of money for me and um and they actually sent me into a recording studio to do like a, a studio version of it and so i i went in i did the studio version and they preferred the i guess they tested it with a bunch of testers and they they actually preferred the homespun lo-fi crazy you know so oh. that's, that's what they used so they they um they licensed that song for like two years and it ran like globally as a as a um you know a commercial and so that was like our down payment on our house in San Francisco. Wow, <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. <laughs> I got like really lucky with some some licensing deals like that. Um and uh yeah and and I realized when when that happened, that's when I kind of realized wow I could actually you know do this for a living you know mm -hmm. um I. You know the songwriting part is my favorite part and the recording part and um yeah so you know so i've been that's i've just sort of kept writing songs and um yeah wow. and life has changed it's like you don't it's it's not like that anymore in my experience you know but uh yeah right yeah they don't yeah they don't pay as much i'm sure i mean maybe if you got a biscuit commercial that'd <laughs> yeah. be a different story but if you yeah my brother-in-law he just got he's got a couple of syncs with his band um he just got another one recently the movie just came out but it's like an amazon prime movie yeah um but he was he had a, a song in the new kissing booth movie on netflix and like yeah but it's not like they're cutting him some huge check and they're like you, you know you're set for life it's like no i know nothing you know i, I, mean, I it's had, something but nothing i know i had netflix license one a couple years ago and it was just like insane how little i got right you know like yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah because like people are pounding at their door now like put my song you know in a in a commercial or in this because even just the i'm sure people just do it for free just to get their name out there and get the credits i know stuff. you're just trying to get your music out exactly so yeah which is yeah it's a it's an interesting turn in the industry where instead of like the artist being you know and kind of in charge and like being like the labels kind of helping them and pushing them out now it's like you you need us so you're lucky that you're even getting on this like that's why we can cut you a 50 dollar check or whatever it is exactly i mean <laughs> it's, it's constantly changing it's the whole thing too from you know the streaming and the saturation and like you know it's like it's it's definitely tough yeah mm -hmm. definitely wow so the well after the family tree you put out uh mine of my own what mm -hmm. was like did you have like a milestone highlight moment of that record um let's see yeah, I just remember we were playing a lot of shows at that point, and um, I think I was actually getting a little tired. It, I hadn't even been doing it that long, but I was kind of like, I, I kind of feel like I need to switch this up. I mean, I feel like we played a lot of shows for that, and then I kind of stepped back. Um, that was kind of a more upbeat album, and um, yeah, and then I kind of stepped back and did like a slower album, and then I kind of hit this place where I was like, um, it's kind of interesting in the kids music world like a lot of people you have this you kind of have this idea of what what it's going to be like if you go to a kids music show mm -hmm. and um you know it's a lot of kids bouncing off the wall and jumping and getting their energy out and that's not really my music at all and i was kind of trying to do that i was i was trying to and it didn't really feel authentic and i started really thinking about like my live shows and and um and sort of like 
I started asking myself, okay, what do I want the people who come to my shows to take away from the show? And what do I want to feel when I leave a show? Because I had enough, I had a lot of great shows, but I also had these terrible shows where I thought like, what am I, what are we doing here? You know? Mm -hmm. Right. And so I started like, yeah, I think around that time I started really thinking about the experience and what I wanted families to take away from the experience. Um, you know, when I write my music, I'm thinking about so many different people. I'm thinking about like, you know, babies, I'm thinking about to toddlers, I'm thinking about like really fragile moms, sleep deprived dads, grandma, like people, all of them listening to these songs. So I'm trying to put something in there for everybody. And um, I kind of wanted my shows to be the same way where, um, you know, people could walk away and uh, just just come out feeling that there's, I, I, I wanted people to feel a certain way coming out. And, and I realized you know, I wasn't like, my lane wasn't the bouncy, energetic kind of family show, which is what people expect. And mm -hmm. um, so for me, I, I kind of reconfigured the whole show and, and uh, it made sense for me to, to use a lot of art. So I wanted to start putting art into the show. And so I kind of spent a lot of time thinking about what that looked like and how I could engage lots of different people with that. And um, yeah, I spent a lot of time Kind of rolling it out. Yeah. Um, other you know, children's artists I've spoken with uh, are saying similar where it's like, how do you capture the attention of, I mean, I have a four-year-old and it's very difficult to get him to yeah. sit there and pay attention for a while. So I'm sure, I mean, the yeah. music is cool and I'm sure they get it for a bit, but it, then it's like, what do you have to do to incorporate into the show? Like, do you have to bring puppets or do you have to bring yeah. these things? And like how, so you decided you went with art and obviously that was working. How did you incorporate it? Yeah. Um, well, like one example, so I, I, I shoot a lot of film just for my own. I just love like shooting video, you know, and I was making, I'd learned Final Cut Pro. I was making little videos. Um, I also was, you know, I had this little zoom microphone. I was going around doing these little collecting little field recording sound. Yeah. And then XM radio would have me every time I released an album, they would have, they, they would let me do these, um, release shows. And so I would put together, it was kind of like, I kind of would think of them as like this American life for kids, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah. I would like basically talk about each song and where, where I got the idea. And then I'd interview people, you know, like I did a song about Jacques Cousteau and I went and interviewed a marine biologist, just all these little things, you know, uh, to give it some context for the kids, you know, and interesting for the parents. And, um, so, so for like, for instance, in my shows, I had this song called uh, Place in Your Heart. And it's about, it's, I don't know if you know that band, The Mates Estate, but they, they sang harmonies with me on, they're this great little, great indie band, but. Um, I've heard the name actually. Yeah, uh, they're um, great. I don't, when, I don't know this, a song off hand, but I don't, I definitely know the name. Yeah, but they, um so it's a song it's kind of like the it's a song uh it's kind of like the uh toy story movie it's about that one toy that like you, as a kid you love and you're always going to keep you're never going to give it up or that one blanket that like you fall asleep you have to have that blanket to fall asleep so that's what the song's about and so for the live show i invited um i invited people i just you know sent an email out to all my friends and invited their kids to come over i have a friend that lives down the street who has a ceramic studio and it's got great light and so I invited the kids to come over to the studio with their one toy, you know, that they love more than oh. any other blanket. And I photographed all these like incredibly loved objects, you know, in this beautiful light and everything. And then for the live shows, I put together this video. So I would be singing the song and you would be seeing these, these, you know, pictures of these um, toys and blankets. And, and it was super tender and so sweet. And like, it, it felt like, this is what I want to do. Like it, it felt real and honest and, um, and that it was speaking to both like, you know, like, like the toddlers and the kids were looking at it like, Oh, you know, I've got a bunny rabbit like that, or Ooh, a death star. You know? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and, but then the parents were taking away how precious this time is, you know, and how like it, we, everyone was getting different things from it. And, mm -hmm. and that's what I wanted. So I, I think I started with that song and then, um, just what I started building like the show, and it became like this kind of multimedia show um, that hopefully like touched people. And there was no example for it. Like I had to like really, you know, create it based on what I like to do, you know? Sure. And so yeah, I, I kind of made art the, the center of it. That's cool. That's really cool. Um, and that was during the mind of my own and then to blink of an eye phase. Yeah, in that time, yeah. Okay. And what about Explore of the World? Yeah, that was, that was, uh, like probably the most fun to make because um, 
I think at that point I was just, uh, I really wanted to mix up my songwriting process. You know, I always started with the guitar, with the chord progressions or the piano. And with Explore the World, the whole theme for that album was like um, paying attention and like, you know, it doesn't matter where you are, you know, even in your backyard, there's like beauty and interesting things to be found. So just opening your eyes and paying attention. And so for that album, I would go out and I would just walk around San Francisco and I had a camera because I made a little book to go with it. But I also had a microphone and I started the songs with field recordings, like all the songs instead of chord progressions, they were based on like, you know, I recorded this bucket drummer down at the Embarcadero okay. and wrote a song with that as my, that's, that was the foundation. And like, oh. I wrote this song called City Don't Sleep. And it was like the symphony of, of taxis and car horns downtown. And that's how I, I, I would just come up with the melody on top of recordings. And then, you know, the song would evolve, but, um, and that was really fun to do. That whole album was really, really fun. It was fun to have a theme like that. And that's um, a cool, cool idea. I've never heard anything like that before. It was really fun. And that one got nominated for a Grammy, which was awesome. Yeah. yeah. How about, tell me about that. Did you get to go to the award show and everything? We did. Yeah, yeah, we did. And I, um, I, I have two sons. I have Liam and Rowan. I have two boys and my husband. We all went. And um, yeah, it was a trip. I mean, you know, LA. So, yeah. You know, it's like, yeah, it was, we were definitely uh, out of our comfort zones, but it was, it was really fun. And yeah, it was great. That must, yeah, that must have been a pretty cool, like, rock star experience. Like, did it you, was. yeah, and then you get to see them, you know, give up the, you know, nominate the award, say your name. I mean, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that was terrifying. I was like, please don't call my name. Please don't call my name. <laughs> did you have a speech that. ready? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I had a couple little things written, but again, it was that stage fright thing. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't think I could physically walk on that up there, you know? Right. Um, and I, Honestly, like the whole experience was, I mean, I had the best day and I was, uh, you know, it was, it was just so much fun to be there. I, I didn't feel any disappointment when I didn't win. So that's really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and then you, you, a couple of years, I mean, we're at, that was the most recent record up until the newest one, right? I mean, the EP, that yeah, there's been a few others, but it's fine. <laughs> yes. Oh, there are, there's others, there's other records in between. Yeah. Just a few. Yeah. I've okay. done, I mean, I've done some adult stuff as well, but not, not yeah. Some, oh, some, okay. So tell yeah. me about that. So you, when did you, when did you start re releasing adult music? Um, let's see. I made, um, I guess I did my first, uh, adult album in 2013 or 2014. It's called Paths, Paths We Have Worn. Um, and then I also just recorded one last year. Um, yeah. And it's just, you know, last year I actually did one, it's called, I, did it under a different name, the name Oscilla instead of my okay. name, just because I thought it'd be better to just separate the two because this one's, um, I was calling it like a synth folk kind of record. Um, I, I did it with John Vanderslice at, at Tiny Telephone Studio. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. So um, yeah, it, it was really, really fun to do. And it, it was just kind of freeing in that, you know, when I do, like I'm, when I'm making music for kids and families, I really am thinking a lot about the audience and who's listening and, and trying to strike that balance. And, you know, when I make stuff that's not for kids, I'm just, I'm just doing what I want to do. Like there's nobody else I really need to think about, you know, mm -hmm. so. That's, have you gone out, do you go out and play your um, other songs? Like, do you bill it and like go out and perform? You know, I just really, well, I actually even have, haven't released the whole album. I've been releasing singles off the new Osilva stuff. And I'd mm -hmm. like to do just some small shows. Um, but, you know, since this last year, <laughs> no one right. did. So I would sure. like to just do like living room shows and like small things like that with it. Yeah. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Speaking of the, like the world shutting down, like where were you at when when this March of last year, like, did you have the honey record ready? Like, tell me a little bit about that. So it, I guess, um, I heard the tiny telephone was going to shut down the recording studio here in San Francisco. And I had such a great experience and I wanted to get into that studio one more time before they demo yeah. place. So, um, I had some songs that I was bringing in there, I guess in February, I went in with a couple friends and had recorded a few songs. And I thought that I would make a lullaby album is what I was thinking. Um, and, and then, yeah, the pandemic hit and shelter in place went into effect. Um, and the funny thing is I had recorded a song called home. And so I had that one done and mastered and everything. And so I released that in like April 
of last year at right when shelter in place, you know, started. And um, that's when Kenny Curtis, who's the guy from eight pound gorilla, he's the one who's leading up that, that label. Um, oh, okay. He heard, he heard it. I mean, they were playing it on XM radio for me and um, he heard it and he was starting this new record label and, and reached out and, and asked if I, you know, want to release that with them. So. Very cool. That's awesome. And yeah. that, so you recorded the, that EP up until April, you said, and then it was complete. No, we had to do it in two, yeah, two different, because we basically, I had more dates and then they had to shut down too. The recording sure. shut down. So, um, so we did two different sessions. So yeah, it happened in two sessions. That's awesome. Yeah. And with, with that, did you, I mean, I know that you said you're not big on touring or anything like that, but what about like promoting the record aside from XM where you do you do the live stream stuff or that's not really in your wheelhouse? You know, I haven't done that. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of inter it's kind of been an interesting time because you know I, I I'm doing music right now, but I also am managing a community park that's across the oh. street from my house. So wow, that's cool. Yeah, so I've been kind of uh, not consumed, but like that's where a lot of my time has been going to the park. And um, yeah, so I haven't done like the online shows, and you know I haven't really done much zooming, or I've just kind of been trying to stay off the computer and you know, mostly doing long walks and <laughs> with my sure. dog and not really, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not really That's cool. Yeah. When you, when you sit down to write stuff for, for like the, with, whether it be children's music or adult music, do you know, like going into it or are you like tinkering around and you're like, Oh, this could be, I could go this way with it or I could go this way with it. How does yeah. That it's, it's that a lot. A lot of times it's just like the chord progression or, um, you know, I just got this um, sequential circuits, old vintage drum machine off oh, Reverb. Cool. Reverb. <laughs> so um, yeah, so some, sometimes I'll just like try to make up little beats and then, um, yeah. And then based on how that sounds like I'll, yeah, I won't know until I start kind of, you know, um, laying down different tracks, what it's gonna, if it's gonna be a kid's or, sure, or sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you working on another record now or are you just kind of focusing on the park? Like, are you working on yeah, music? No, I'm, well, I am. I mean, I'm I, It's really funny. I was like 2020. I didn't write music at all. I mean, I felt wow. so not create. I just didn't have any creative juices flowing at all. Like I was mm -hmm. numb. I feel like, like a lot of people. And I did do that one little recording, honey. But aside mm -hmm. from that, you know, usually I'm, I'm writing. I feel like it's part of who I am. I like, I just, I, I like to constantly be writing music and I just, had nothing and I had no ideas. And, um, but, uh, after the election, I started feeling like a little bit lighter okay. and um, <laughs> yeah, it's things like started to, to come back. So I've actually, I've actually been writing tons of songs like the last, um, month or so, like month and a half. And, um, yeah, so I'm sure I'll, I'll be recording at some point. I actually, I'm, I have dates booked at, at tiny telephone in Oakland for next month. Um, very cool. Out some stuff yeah and that will that become uh do you know what it's going to be is it going to be more children's songs it's be children's yeah okay yeah that is awesome but i also have those silla songs that i've got too um so yeah you know i just i'm always writing so that's very cool yeah that's awesome well thank you so much for for talking with me i really appreciate it yeah thank you adam thanks so much for having me on of course i do have one more question for you francis before i let you go uh, I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Um, you know, I think like, especially for songwriters, I think it's just putting in the work, you know, like, don't, like they say, don't wait for inspiration, just show up, sit down, write. Even if you don't write, just sit down and make space to make it a practice, you know, and just, uh, just work at it. It takes a lot of work, <laughs> you know, songs take a lot of work. Yeah. Bring me the bad word.